Well, we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 18 tonight as we continue our series here in the book of Romans. And so I'll begin reading at verse 1. I'll read verses 1 through 4, and we'll get into our study. Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 4. Paul writes, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So Paul has just written concerning a war, a war that is a spiritual war, a war that is raging within us. We saw that in chapter 7 at verse 18 and 19 when he had said, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil I will not to do, that I practice. And he went on into verse 23. He said, I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind, bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. And so as any Christian desiring to live for Christ, as any Christian who desires to live for Christ, well, that same Christian will encounter conflict within the desire to please the Lord battles with our inclinations, as you know, to satisfy the lust of our flesh. In, in Galatians chapter 5, verse 17, Paul had said it like this. He said, the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you want. And so we know this war, this war that rages within us. And this continuous internal battle can begin to wear us down. You know, our own hearts can cause us to feel guilty. Our own hearts and memories can remind us of what we've been. And, and that's the reality that propelled him to write verse 24 of chapter 7 when he said, O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver, deliver me from this body of death? So he understood that, that battle within. Who will deliver me is his cry. I'm, I'm tired of this and and I don't want to be going through this. I'm a wretched man. Who's going to deliver me? He went on in verse 25, and he said, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Who will deliver me? God. God delivers me. It reminds me of what we read in 1 John chapter 3, verse 20, when, when John had said, if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. He knows all things. Who's going to deliver me from this body of death? Thank God, through Jesus Christ. He's the one who delivers us. And so as we begin, we know, even as Paul has already stated, that every person entering into the world has entered as a sinner. Psalm 51.5 says, Surely I've been a sinner from birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. And no other, no other human being, no other person who wore human flesh, no other uh, than Jesus has ever been exempt of this. So that answers the question, why do people do such evil things? Why do evil things occur? Well, it, they, be, they occur because of our human nature. They, they, they occur because by nature we are sinful. Our unredeemed human nature does what is natural for it to do. When you read your Bible, Paul actually gives lists of, of some of the things that human nature produces, the sinful things. He said in Galatians 5, 19 through 21, he said, the acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. And he went on to say, I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. And so, because of that, all unbelievers are justly under God's condemnation. You see, the fruit of living a habitual, sinful life 
is judgment, final judgment. He had said that the wrath of God is revealed in heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. When he was writing to the Ephesians in chapter 5, he said in verses 5 and 6, This you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. And he went on to say something important. Obviously, he said, let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. There are pulpits today in the United States will say it's okay to do that. I saw a video of a man who, who said that there was a holiness in, uh, in um, being a drag queen. And so there are people, and he actually called it a gift. So there are, I, I've looked through the gifts of the Spirit, haven't seen that yet, you know. <laughs> But that's what he said, and he was a preacher, by the way. He was, he was, by the way, he was on, on, in his pulpit, and he was, quote-unquote, preaching. So is it possible for us to live with no sense or anticipation of condemnation? Well, that's what Paul is saying as we begin our, our study here in chapter 8. Notice what he says. Now, he's already outlined that, that there's a war within. He's already outlined that all have fallen short of the glory of God. He's already outlined those kinds of things, and he's spoken concerning this war and all. And he had said, uh, who's going to deliver me? But now he, in verse 1, says this, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So there's now no condemnation. Now notice how he says, to those who are in Christ Jesus. Now the phrase in Christ Jesus, you might find this interesting. If you take notes, you might want to note this. The phrase in Christ Jesus is used around 164 times in the New Testament. You know, the, the air is, is what is fit for the bird. The sea is what is fit for the fish. And we are in Christ Jesus as the bird is in the air and the fish is in the sea. We are in Christ Jesus. When he speaks concerning that, it's another way of speaking of salvation. It speaks about us, how we came into a relationship with Jesus Christ. When he wrote to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, he said it like this. He said, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. So we all belong together. We all have different gifts and abilities. One person is an eye, another person is an ear. One person is a hand, another person is a foot. And Paul speaks concerning that, and he says, which of those is unnecessary? Every one of those is necessary. And so we are all necessary in the body of Christ. We've all been placed in the body of Christ through salvation, and there's one body. And so he's speaking about us being in relationship to Jesus Christ because we are in Christ. And so being a Christian is more than simply an outward form of identification. Uh, being a Christian is being in Christ. That means there's a spiritual union with God through Jesus that resulted because of our faith in Christ. We're in Christ. We're united with Jesus by faith. We're in union with him. In John 15, he said it like this. John 15, verse 1, he said, I'm the true vine, and my father is the gardener. And he went on in verses 4 and 5, and he said, Remain in me, and I will remain in you. Just as no branch can bear fruit by itself unless it remains in the vine, neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him will bear much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And so we're in Christ. We have been grafted in. We'll see that later on in this, in this book. But we're in Christ. And in Christ, because we've been grafted in, we are in this true vine. We produce fruit because we're in him. And so because we are in Christ, notice again in verse 1, we have no fear of judgment. We have no condemnation. No fear of judgment. In John 5, 24, Jesus said it like this. He said, most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. In John 6, 47, most assuredly, I say unto you, he who believes in me has eternal life. And so that came from our receiving the promises of God, placing our faith in Jesus Christ, and now having a relationship with him. And we are now in Christ. 
And so, verse 1 again, the fruit of being in Christ is we no longer walk, notice, according to the flesh. According to the flesh. We no longer live to satisfy our carnal desires. So instead, we walk according to the power and the leading of the Spirit of God. We don't walk in the flesh. We walk in what is called walking in the Spirit. In Galatians 5.16, he had said, walk in the Spirit. You shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So as Christians, we reveal that we're walking in the Spirit in some very basic ways. For example, what is our walk like? What is our way of life like? What is our manner of life like? Well, in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 7, we, we walk by faith and not by sight. A second aspect of walking in this way is our obedience and love evidence that we're walking in the Spirit. In 2 John, verse 6, this is love, that we walk in obedience to His commands. And as you've heard from the beginning, His command is that you walk in love. And then third, it's evidenced by a love for the truth. It's a love for God's Word, that which is the truth. In 3 John verse 4, John said something that as an apostle and a minister, it's something that I as a pastor can say. He said in 3 John verse 4, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. And so that's a symbol or evidence that you are walking in the spirit. You walk by faith. You have obedience and love for the word of God and others. And, and that's how it demonstrates that you know the Lord. And so he says in verse 1 again, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who don't walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. Verse 2, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. The law of the Spirit of life is a principle. It's a principle of spiritual life that works within us. We have liberty in Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. We've been set free from the bondage of the law. You see, in 2 Corinthians 3.17, Paul said, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. And so, verse 3, for what the law could not do, why? Because it was weak through the flesh. Well, in the law, God had set standards no human being could achieve. Again, we saw in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We couldn't fulfill its demands. So, Jesus did it. On our behalf. That's why he could look at anybody, including his own family, he could say this to his, his mother Mary. He could say, which of you can convict me of sin? Which of you? He could, he could look at his brothers. What an odd upbringing they would have had. Imagine that, living with a perfect person. Isn't, that would be difficult. Living with a perfect person would be, Marie has trouble with it every day. <laughs> <laughs> living with a perfect person is very hard. She'll tell you. But imagine that. We cannot fulfill the intentions of the law. We could do the best that we can and still not satisfy it completely. That's why we need the grace of God. And so Jesus came to fulfill the demands of the law so that we could uh, have relationship with the Lord. And he gave his life as a ransom. In Matthew 5, 17, he said, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets, I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And that's what he did. And so in verse 3, he said, God did this by sending his own son in the likeness of flesh, of human flesh. God did this by sending Jesus Christ, who had the outer appearance. He looked, he was, in other words, he's a physical human being. It's speaking of his incarnation. Jesus, he's saying, became fully human, yet he was without sin. When he was writing to the Philippians in chapter 2, he said it like this. Speaking of Christ in verses 6 through 8, he said, Who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. It's speaking of the incarnation that God took upon himself human flesh. So he sent his son in the likeness of man. And what did he do in verse 3? He condemned sin in the flesh. Again, in the flesh speaks of his substitutionary death on behalf of us. He died for us. Isaiah prophesied that in chapter 53 of his book, verses 4 and 5, when he was speaking concerning Messiah, he said, surely he took up our infirmities, carried our sorrows, Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. 
but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. By his wounds, we are healed. So he condemns sin in the flesh by taking upon himself my sin, our sin, and in doing so, gave to us his righteousness. He says in verse 4, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. The requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us by faith in Jesus. We're unable to keep the requirements of the law, so we're made righteous. We're made righteous by faith in Jesus Christ, because as he fulfilled the law, he did so on our behalf. I've, I've mentioned this scripture more than once, 2 Corinthians 5.21 but it bears repetition here. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We're unable to keep the requirements, but Jesus did it on our behalf. In verse 5, those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. So what he's going to do here is contrast the life of the Spirit-filled man spirit-filled woman, versus the carnal life. Now, the person in the flesh indulges their bent towards rebellion in everything they do. They're bent towards rebellion. If you say it's black, they say it's white. If you say it's up, they say it's down. If you say it's sweet, they say it's sour. If they say stop, they say go. It's just a rebellion against order. And the Bible says in Proverbs 4.16, evil people can't sleep until they've done their evil deeds for the day. They can't rest until they've caused someone to stumble. And there's truth to that. But Christians set their mind on the things of the Spirit. What it's been called is a holy longing. Like it says in Psalm 39, verse 7, Now, O Lord, for what do I wait? My hope is in you. So instead of us pursuing the things of the flesh, where there is a just due penalty for those things. Now that we're saved, we live for Christ and walk in the spirit. And our, our hope is set on something higher and it's more majestic. It's, it's being with him and serving him. And so he says in verse six, he says, to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. To be carnally minded is death. You can only party for so long until you realize it's empty. You can do it for a week, you can do it for a month, you can party for a year, you can party for 10 years, you can party your whole life away. And at the end, you realize this was an empty life. Eventually, you realize it. And ultimately, what happens is you die. And very often, you die alone. And you die unfulfilled. And then ultimately, you're judged. To be carnally minded is death. To be setting your affections on things below rather than things above. And to be tasting and drinking of the water of the world every day only leaves you thirsty. But when your mind is set on the things of the Lord, well, there's life and there's peace from God. We, we set our affections on the things of eternity. And I have to tell you, um, the, 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 the longer you walk with the Lord, the more aware you are of eternity the, the longer you walk with jesus the more aware you are that you're just passing through at a certain point some of you will discover this some have already i've discovered this now at this point in my life when you're young you're, you're caught up with with all the kinds of things that you, you can be caught up with you you get caught up with your education. You get caught up with relationship. You get caught up with your job. You get caught up with a variety of things. You know, these are things that you pursue. And many of those are the things that are necessary at that time in your life. There's no condemnation concerning those things. But you do get caught up with them. Then if you get married and you have your children, you're caught up with raising the children. And as they grow up and everything, you get caught up with wanting them out of the house. I mean, that's how it works. <laughs> But you do, you get caught up with quite a number of things over time. And, and after a while, you may, you may be blessed and fortunate enough to achieve many of the goals that you set for yourself. You got the degrees, you got the good job, you got the nice neighborhood, you have a nice vehicle, you have relationship, you have all of those things. And yet, if you don't have Christ in the center of them, it's all emptiness. And then ultimately what happens is you get to the end of your life and then you have a chance to look back over your life and you begin to wonder whether or not you accomplished the things that really mattered. 
And when you begin to speak to people and you ask them concerning what their greatest regret is, very often they'll say, I didn't spend enough time with those I loved. I didn't spend enough time relaxing. I didn't spend enough time enjoying. I spent so much time doing all the work to get the things I wanted. And I never even enjoyed it. Many years ago, there was a song concerning a man who it was called Mr. Businessman, and it speaks concerning him having roses in the garden. He says, have you even smelled the roses in the garden? Have you ever listened to the laughter of your children when they set about to play? You know, all you've done is survive, but you've never lived was the whole point of it. Why is that? Because we're pursuing, he was pursuing the things that didn't matter. He was pursuing the things that didn't last. And so Christians, when we walk in the spirit, we're seeking the things of the Lord. And that's what we want. In Colossians 3, 1 and 2, if, if, if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God, your mind on things above not on things on the earth. So we have abundant life. We have peace. We have peace with God and we have peace from God. Well, he says in verse, verse 7, he says, the carnal mind is enmity. It's that constant hostility. It's at war. The unspiritual mind, the carnal mind is, is enmity against God. It's not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. The non-Christian is in a constant state of hostile warfare against the Lord. Again, in Colossians 1.21, he had said, once you were alienated from God, you were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. And so your minds were not set on the things above, he's saying. The carnal mind is that constant war against God, isn't subject, isn't voluntarily submit to him, is in constant battle against him. So he says, the result, verse 8, so then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Why? Well, there's no spirit-led longing to do so, to, to have a, a, a genuine, a, a real desire to please God requires re regeneration, requires being born again, because with regeneration comes the desire to please God. And so you can't please them no matter what you do, no matter how many prayers, no matter how many times you go to church, no matter how much money you spend, no matter how much charitable work you do, you can't please God. Because even the things that are being done in the name of God very often are done for personal benefit. It's so that someone may look at you and say, oh boy, what a good person you are. What a generous person you are. So in fact, what they're doing is what Jesus condemned. You know, they're doing their works before men to be seen by men and receive the praise of men. It takes a genuine believer to do it without the desire to be recognized for what they're doing. It's been said the most beautiful sound in any person's ear is the sound of their own name on somebody else's lips. Well, I'm glad that I don't have that spirit. Well, sometimes we, sometimes we do. Sometimes we want to be recognized, but not all the time. The Lord has a way of breaking us because of that and bringing humility to us. And so he's making it clear. He says, if you're in the flesh, you can't please God, verse 9, but you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he's, he's not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. And so in verse 9, he, he says, you're not in the flesh. If you're saved, in other words, you no longer are opposed to God. Now your body dies because the wages of sin is death. And, and you will ultimately, we all, unless the rapture occurs, which we pray for, of course, you will, I will, we will physically die. And we're in the state of dying daily. Some of us can say amen to that very loudly. Though we are physically dying, faith in Christ is actually producing life in us. In John eleven twenty five 25 and 26, Jesus was speaking and he said, I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, Though he may die, he shall live. Whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Your body may physically die, 
but spiritually you're alive. So he says in verse 10, if, if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. In other words, because of sin, physical death still occurs even for believers. Yet, though physical death occurs, we will be raised to life. He says in verse 11, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. We are the temple of the spirit of God and the spirit of God dwells in us. I think that's one of the things that um, I need to sometimes remember out loud to, to us, the congregation of believers, because there's still a very real What's the word? There's, there's a real evidence that there are some who have yet to come to understand that, that you are the temple of the Spirit of God. We, many of us were raised with the mentality of going to church, right? What are you going to do this Sunday? I'm going to church. And that, that's a phrase we use, and it's a generalization. We know that. But we get the idea that the building is the church. So where are you going to, oh, this Sunday? I'm going to church. No, the church, we know this, is the individual believer in Christ. We are his temple. And what happens right now is the church is gathered together. The building doesn't matter. We know that. It's that we matter. Why? Because he has dwelt in us by his spirit. In the Old Testament, they built a temple. They had a tabernacle at one time. It was a portable tent, a place of worship. And there were various items that were within that. And it was to be transported to various locations as they traveled. But in the, in the later years, a man by the name of David, King David, had it in his heart to build a temple for God. And even went about drawing up plans and things to do so. And, and the prophet came and spoke to him and said, when did God tell you to build a temple? Has God given you a command to do that? It, this thing in your heart is a good thing. But David, you're a man of war. There is blood on your hands. God will not allow you to build that temple. Your son Solomon, Solomon is going to build the temple. Why? Because he was a man of peace. David, you're a man of war. And so that's how the temple was first built. And there were requirements for the children of Israel at a certain age, above 20, males 20 and above, were to meet in and go to temple at least three times a year for specific feasts. And so the people would go to temple. And in the New Testament, the temple goes to people. When you got saved, you became the temple of the Spirit of God. And now the temple is no longer in Jerusalem. Jesus said the gospel shall begin to be preached in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. So we don't go to the temple. The temple goes to to the people, and we go out to minister. And when we gather like this, is for the purpose of learning, so we're equipped for works of service so that we can speak to those who don't know the Lord and help them to become the temple of God themselves. And so the Spirit of God dwells within us. And so we are that temple. Now, notice how Paul speaks of the Spirit. He also speaks, says the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ, and those are interchangeable. In verse 9, he speaks of the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ, and in verse 11, he speaks of the Spirit of Him, meaning God's Holy Spirit. And the Spirit of Him raised Jesus from the dead. In other words, death could not hold Jesus. Acts 2.24, Peter said, God raised Him from the dead, freeing Him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Let this sink into our hearts. The same power that brought Christ from the dead works within us. Works within us. It's been said the resurrection is an ongoing thing. We grieve the loss because there is an emotional loss. We grieve the loss of those we love. But they're never lost. When I lose something, and I used to lose things all the time because I was a, a doper. And I... I smoked so much pot that I began losing my memory. I, I couldn't remember where I put my keys. It actually became kind of a, an Easter egg hunt every day with my mom. I, I, I never knew where I put my keys. And, and she didn't know I was a Lodi. We used to call it a Lodi. I don't know what it's called now. She didn't know that I was constantly loaded. She didn't know that. She just thought I was weird. 
every morning my mom and I would have a, a hunt for my keys every morning because I would just walk in and just put them down somewhere, you know. And that's how it used to be. It used to be that way. But God has a way of changing lives, doesn't he? And the spirit of God dwelling in you causes you to, to aspire to greater things, transforms your life, changes your purpose, gives you meaning, and causes you to, to, to be inspired to pursue him, to follow him. And, and it's this power that works within us and gives, you, gives us life. And it's an ongoing thing. In verse 12, he says, Therefore, brethren, we're debtors not to the flesh to live according to the, to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you're going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you'll live. So we are under obligation to live for God, not our fleshly desires. Why is that? It's because Jesus, Jesus bought us. Jesus, Jesus purchased us in redemption. We belong to him. In 1 Corinthians 6, verse 20, you were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body and your spirit, which belong to God. He redeemed you. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. He took you from the from the marketplace of sin. He redeemed you. During the time of the writing of the New Testament. They had the, uh, a marketplace. And they would, they would sell slaves there. And uh, somebody would come. And they actually paid what was called the price of redemption. And in the purchase of that person. That person who was purchased that slave that one who bought him had options. They could use him during the time of the Romans and Greeks as a, as a living tool, which is what one of the writers, the historians of that day, referred to slaves as. Or they could redeem to set free. We were in the marketplace of sin, as a picture in Scripture, but somebody redeemed us. They paid that redemptive price. The price was the blood of Christ. And he chose to take us out of bondage because the one who is in sin, Jesus said, is a slave to sin. He redeemed us, purchased us, and the cost was his blood. He did so to set us free because all our lives we had been held captive by the enemy to do his will. But now, because we've been saved, he has given us a new nature and new desires that go along with that. So rather than remaining in lives of sin... We have now been set free to be pleasing to him. And by reading the word and walking in his spirit, we're aware of the lust of our flesh, and therefore we die to those things, and we pursue those things that bring honor to God by the power of the Holy Spirit. Titus 2.12 says, Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. In verse 13, he said, If you live according to the flesh, you'll die but if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Now, when he speaks of this, he's speaking, obviously, of the unbeliever who lives according to the flesh. These people are coming under God's judgment. They order their lives according to pleasing their flesh. They have no clue about loving and serving the Lord. As a matter of fact, it's just stupid to them. It's just foolishness to them. You know, there are people who are very caught up with just living for their flesh. Um, I can still remember it was in this room many years ago now, and I gave a, an invitation. And off to my right over here in this direction, I saw movement right over here. And uh, I didn't know what was going on, but you could see movement there. And later on, I was told what it was. When I gave the invitation and said, if you need Christ, please come forward, this young woman began to stand up to come forward. And her boyfriend grabbed her and pulled her down, pulled her down and wouldn't let her. He wouldn't let her out of the seat. He wanted to live in the flesh. This young lady wanted to live for Jesus. And he didn't come forward. She didn't come forward. I don't remember seeing her ever again. That happens. He says in verse 13, if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you shall live. If you reject, listen, even hating the sin that you were once held by, that's a good thing. 
You put to death the old way of life through spiritual discipline. In uh, 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27, Paul said it like this. He said, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way as to take the prize. Everyone who competes in the games trains with strict discipline. They do it for a crown that is perishable, but we do it for a crown that is imperishable. Therefore, I do not run aimlessly. I do not fight like I am beating the air. No, I discipline my body, make it my slave, so that after I've preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. When he says, I won't be disqualified, I want to receive the full reward. It's like what it says in 2 John verse 8. Watch yourselves so that you may not lose what you have worked for, but may win a full reward. I don't want to lose a single element of a reward, so I discipline myself. Being filled with the Spirit gives us strength to live for Christ and no longer satisfy the flesh. Notice in verse 14. He says, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. <laughs> we are his children, and by his Spirit, he directs us. We're led by the Spirit through God's words and the internal promptings of the Spirit. Let me share a couple of things about that. In John 16, verse 13, Jesus said, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but Whatever he hears, he will speak and he will declare to you the things that are to come. You see, the Holy Spirit leads us in our daily lives. There's an intimacy, and I want to develop this with you for a moment. There is an intimacy that we as children can have with our father. I have four children. And they have, they have insight into me that that children will have for a dad. There are people who can say, I know what your father will do. And they, they know me well enough to be able to say that, well, I know what your father would do. They could say that. I know what your father would do. But my children can tell you why I do what I do. And there's a difference. Someone can see the actions and explain what they've seen in the past. But others can see the heart and know why that's being done. When you are a child of God, it's not that you're just talking about what God can do. I've been around a lot of people who can tell me things that God can do. It's not hard to find things that God can do. Just pick up the Bible and look, and you see it. But there aren't that many who can tell you why he does what he does. And there's a difference in that. We don't want to know just the actions of God. We want to know the ways of God. We want to know why he does what he does. And that takes intimacy. And so when he's speaking concerning the Holy Spirit and the way the Holy Spirit works within us, he's speaking of how we have this intimate connection with God and we know his actions and the reasons that he acts in this way. In other words, we have communion with God by his spirit. Now you see in scripture that that the Holy Spirit is one who leads you. Again, verse 14, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. And so we see examples of the Spirit leading, for example, in Matthew 4, verse 1, where it says that Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. The Spirit led him there. In the book of Acts, in chapter 8, that particular chapter records how an evangelist, the only one in Scripture, by the way, who's referred to as an evangelist, a man named Philip, how that the evangelist Philip went south of Jerusalem to an area called Gaza. And while he was there, he ran into a very powerful and influential uh, Ethiopian eunuch. Now, this Ethiopian eunuch was, was in his chariot, chariot, and he was reading the book of Isaiah. And as this was happening in Acts 8, 29, the spirit said to Philip, go over to that chariot, stay by it. Now, Philip, we read that story, he saw that this man was reading Isaiah. And, and he, the man said, Phil, Philip said, do you understand what you're reading? And the man said, how can I unless somebody teaches me? So what are you reading? Well, he was reading out of Isaiah and he read the portion and explained that, that it was speaking of Messiah. And that, that, uh, that Ethiopian 
came to faith in Christ. And so the Spirit, those who walk in the Spirit, were led by the Spirit. God will lead us to do those kinds of things. In Acts 13, it records how the Antiochian uh, church leaders were in prayer and worship. And in Acts 13, 2 and 3, it said, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. And after they fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. They were fasting. They were praying, seeking the Lord. He said, set apart. And that's how they went off on one of their ministry experiences. So being led by the Spirit is another way of speaking of having communion with God. There are times when God prompts you to action. Let me tell you a story. It's story time. I was thinking of all these things that I could share with you today because, because the Holy Spirit leads us and prompts us. But this was not that long ago. My wife Marie and I were driving to New Mexico. And uh, I, I can't see very well in the dark. I, I have a, a night blindness. And also, um, you know, glaucoma. And I had a cataract in my left eye. And so I'm driving. It's around 12 or 1 in the morning. No lights. Those of you who've driven into Arizona and all at night, you're in desert, right? And they're doing construction. No line in, in the lane that I'm in. No line. And so as, it's as good as a single lane to me. So normally what I'm hoping for is a car in front of me. So I can just kind of tail them, you know, and follow. Because I can't see in the dark. And it's pitch black. There's no lights. And as I'm driving, we're going 55, 60 miles an hour. And everything in front of me is pitch black. It's totally, I can't, I, I'm driving by the, by the lights. As, and you know, you're going that fast. You're, 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 you're traveling faster than you think you are. Covering more ground than you think you are. And I began to get a bit nervous. Now, my wife doesn't know this because I'm Mr. Macho. She wouldn't know. <laughs> but I got a little nervous because I couldn't see. And I'm driving. It's just as good as me just driving into, into darkness. And so that's, I'm driving. And now there are cars, and there's this kind of one of these gullies. And then cars coming on the other side. And I think within myself, I think, turn on your brights. Because you can't see. I'm, I'm reasoning with myself. And I said, no, I can't. Because um, my, my lights will blind the drivers who are on the other side of the road. I can't do that. But I sensed the Spirit of the Lord say, turn on your brights. So I did. I turned my brights on. And right in front of me, I was driving straight to the lip. I was about to go over and hit that gully. But it was the spirit of the Lord who said, and I know it was, he said, turn on your brights. He actually did it twice. The first time I thought it was me. Second time I knew. That wasn't the first time something like that happened. I'll give you another brief story. We were on our way into towards the Glendale area. Marie and I are driving. It's a four-lane highway. I usually drive on the, in the um, third lane. And... There's no traffic in front of me and no traffic behind me. And I sense the spirit say, change lanes. And so this time I did it quickly. Change lanes. Why? Why would I do that? Change lanes. I changed to the slow lane, what we call the slow lane. And as I did that, within 10 seconds, uh, an 18-foot stake bed blew through the fence, come in the opposite direction, shot into my lane, and then went back into you know what? The Holy Spirit still communicates. He still leads you. He still prompts you. And what we need to learn to do is to listen. To listen. I, I can't imagine how many conversations I've stifled with him simply because I thought it was just me. Maybe too much salsa, I don't know. <laughs> so the Holy Spirit, by his word, teaches you his ways. But in fellowship with him, he also leads you in your footsteps. That's why you pray. That's why you seek God. That's why you say, what do you want me to do today? How do you want to do this, Lord? So that he's actually 
actually leading you. The Spirit always leads us to obey the Word of God and always leads us to glorify Jesus Christ. Now, finally, in verse 15, he says, You did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. You received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit. We are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, we may also be glorified together. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Now, when he speaks of the spirit of bondage, that's referring to a frame of mind. Bondage to sin results in a life filled with fear because you can't keep the law. But we have received not the spirit of bondage, but a spirit of adoption. It's the Holy Spirit who, who gives us the ability to have a relationship with God and, and gives us that secure knowledge of fellowship with him. And the spirit in verse 16, he, he bears witness with our spirit. We belong to him. There's an inner testimony. I belong to God. And, and, and it's the Holy Spirit who produces a love for God, a hatred for sin, and a desire to walk in holiness. And so in verse 17, if we're children, we're heirs. We're, we're heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. We are heirs of God. He is the one who is going to give to us what is called our inheritance. And he himself actually is our inheritance, but we're joint heirs with Jesus. Uh, in Christ, we, we receive through him. He's the heir of all honor and glory of heaven, and we're in him and united with him, and all that he inherits, this is amazing, we inherit in him. In John 17, 22, the glory you gave me, I have given them that they may be one even as we are, one. But he closes by saying, Indeed, if indeed we, we suffer with him, that we may be glorified together with him. If we suffer for his cause and bear the afflictions and pain as he did, is what he's speaking about. You know, Philippians 1.29 says, it has been, uh, To you it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. And you know what he says in verse 18? I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. I love 2 Corinthians 4, 17, and we'll close with this. Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. What we go through may feel like forever right now, but he says it's only for a moment. We go through it, and there's a weight of glory Someone wrote, as believers, often suffering comes through men, but glory comes from God. Our suffering is short, but our glory is forever.